Hi, and welcome back to Temple Baptist Church. This is the adult Sunday school lesson, and uh, this is the lesson for December the 31st, the last day of 2023. Welcome. Happy New Year. We're glad that you're with us today. This lesson um, comes from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. We use this particular Sunday school book, Explore the Bible series, and um, this uh, study in Genesis we just started at the beginning of December, and so we've still got a couple more months to go. If you don't have one of these books, please contact our church office, Temple Baptist Church, Poplar Bluff. We'd be happy to get you one of these so that you could study it on your own and then follow along um, with us as we do these lessons online. The title of this particular lesson is called The First Murder, and uh, this is the story of Cain and Abel. Most people are familiar with this particular um, story. You remember that God had created everything, and on the sixth day, God as well had created Adam and Eve. And God created them um, to be able to have a relationship with him. That relationship was broken when they chose to sin. Sin entered the world through Eve's enticement. She gave in to the words of um, the serpent, uh, which was being controlled by Satan. And she took the fruit. She ate it. She gave the fruit to Adam. He also ate it. Their eyes were opened. And at that particular point, they realized both good and evil. And they knew that they had disobeyed God. Sin broke the relationship that they had with God the Father. Sin, as well, would continue to grow in the hearts and the lives of men. Um, and we see the consequence and the result of the fall, that first sin, um, in the struggle between um, Cain and Abel. And actually, we see it even before um, Cain goes to the field and kills his brother, his younger brother. We see it in his relationship with God the Father. And so <clears throat> this is what some people might classify as a murder mystery. Um, if you're a film buff, uh, maybe you like murder mysteries. And in the sense of it being some type of a murder mystery, um, I have a little two-sentence paragraph that I want to start with uh, before we get into this, and uh, it just kind of helps lay the groundwork for what we're doing. So listen carefully. It all started on a sunny day with warm, pleasant temperatures and beautiful, lazy clouds drifting by overhead. Then, within the length of a short conversation, everything changed, and the nightmare started. And truly it was a nightmare. Listen as I read the scripture beginning with verse 1 of Genesis chapter 4. It says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Let's stop right there. Here is what we know about the situation. Sin had entered in to the lives of Adam and Eve. 
when they gave in to the temptation of Satan. It was at that particular point that they first knew evil. In chapter 3, verse 5, in his conversation with um, Eve, Satan says, um, he, he questions whether or not she can eat of the fruit. She says in verse 2, we may not eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And so Adam had taught Eve that she shouldn't go near the tree and that she shouldn't eat of the tree uh, because it would bring death. They didn't know at this particular point what death was, but God had instructed them that they would die if they ate of the tree. Satan says to her, you will not surely die. And then he says, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. They already knew what was good. God had created everything in the garden and everything throughout the universe, and he had pronounced it as good. It was exactly as he intended for it to be. It was perfect in every way. And their relationship with God was perfect. They were able to walk with God, talk with God, have conversations with him. They knew good, righteousness, holiness, perfection. What they did not know was evil. And they didn't have a good definition or a good model of what evil was. But at the moment that they ate the fruit, their hearts became evil because they disobeyed God. And evil is disobedience before God. Evil is sin. And in fact, evil can be classified as godlessness. So if there is the righteousness with God and there is unrighteousness and unholiness that's opposed to God, evil is the absence of righteousness. It's the absence of holiness. It's the absence of a relationship with God the Father. They gained an evil insight on that particular day. And that evil was passed down to their own child. We get down to chapter 2, verse 23. It says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore God sent him out of the garden of Eden Eden, to till the ground from which he was taken. And so he, wrote, he drove out Adam and Eve and he gave them the job of tilling the ground in order to obtain what was necessary for their food. Sin, regardless of the extent of the sin, regardless of the severity of the sin, comes from a position of being anti-God. Anti-God. Evil is anti-God. Sin is anti-God. And what they did on that particular day was anti-God. And that anti-God part of their heart would be passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person that has ever lived because of Adam and Eve. And so that sin nature was passed on to Cain as their firstborn son and then to Adam who was his younger brother. I said Adam, I mean Abel. And so Eve, we see here in chapter 3, uh, or excuse me, chapter, um, yeah, chapter 3, verse 20, Eve was the mother of all living. That's important to know. Eve conceived and born her firstborn son and named his name Cain, which literally means acquire. She had said there in verse 1, 
I have acquired a man from the Lord. And so the word acquire in the Hebrew is Cain. Then Eve, it says there in verse 2, Eve um, conceived again, and this time she bore a brother to Cain, and she named him Abel. Abel in the Hebrew has the, the meaning of breath. So um, Cain, she had acquired from the Lord. He was the one that God gave her. It was probably her perspective that he was going to be the one to uh, kill, to overthrow the serpent. You remember back in chapter 2, in verse, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 15, God says uh, to Adam and Eve, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so um, God had told the serpent, there is one that's going to um, rise up who is going to kill you. Um, basically, that's what that means. And so Eve thought, well, God has given me a son because he had declared that it would be a male person, and that's going to be the one who is going to um, kill the serpent who uh, enticed and led me astray. Now, that's not what the scripture actually says, but we read that in, and, and it would be logical to think that that's the way that she was thinking. And so Cain, at this particular point, had been given the job of farming. We don't know um, how many years passed between the time that Adam and Eve were driven out of the uh, Garden of Eden and uh, she conceived and had Cain. We don't know how many years there were. We also don't know how many years there were between Cain and Abel. But Cain had been given the job of tilling the ground. He had been given the job of farming and helping them to reap, reap their fruits from um, all of the plant life that was there. Um, he was one that, um, he, I guess he would uh, not only grow whatever grain that was there um, in their midst, but he would as well harvest what came from the trees that they were able to eat. And so that was his job. It was an important job. It was a job that um, followed along with what Adam needed to do on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, we've heard that phrase, like father, like son. Well, in this particular case, that's true. Adam had to become a farmer, and Cain became a farmer. Adam um, was where he was because of sin, and Cain as well. Um, was where he was because of the consequence of sin. And so Abel, however, was assigned the job of being a shepherd. He was shepherding the sheep. And um, we know that back in chapter 3, um, God had killed an animal. We would assume that it was some type of a sheep. And God had sewn together um, clothes from the skin of that animal for Adam and Eve so that they would be covered. And likewise, um, Adam and Eve would have then uh, killed um, an animal to make clothes for all of their children as well as for themselves. And their clothes would have been made from the hide, the skin of that particular animal and it's very likely that they, rather than throwing out the meat from that animal, that they uh, somehow cooked that and, and ate that. Um, and so it doesn't tell us that um, for sure in this particular passage, but we do know from the sacrifice or from the offering that Abel brought before God that the meat and especially the fat of the animal were um, things to be, um, they, were, they were important. They were things to be um, honored. And um, so Eve um, here, uh, 
sees Cain, she sees Abel. We know that they have their particular jobs, and um, one is a farmer and one is a shepherd. Now, we get to the very first lesson in the book, and that lesson is titled Rivalry. The author wants you to see that there was a rivalry that came up between the two brothers. And I don't know if it was as much a rivalry as it was um, that there was uh, one brother, Cain, um, that felt like um, he wasn't honored enough. And because of the sin that was already in his heart, he gave into that sin, and that sin became uh, an actionable behavior that ultimately led him to kill his brother. I, I said before that we don't know exactly how much time passed. It starts off by saying here in verse 3, in the process of time. And so that's just a way of saying that over the course of time, and there could have been um, years that had passed from the time that Cain and Abel were boys, they were growing up, they were learning all sorts of things, they had grown into manhood, and at that particular time, manhood may have very well looked like um, the age of 12 or 13 or 14. In Jewish tradition, um, a boy becomes a man uh, basically at the age of around 12. And so it could be that they maybe weren't actually that old. Um, we don't know exactly how old they were. But it says, over the process of time, there came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And we also don't know if this was the very first time that Cain had brought an offering. We don't know if Cain had seen his parents take an offering to the Lord before. And now, as um, being a man, being a person that was of age, it was his responsibility to bring his own um, to the Lord. We don't know any of those particular things. But we do know that within his heart, there was sin. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. So it says that he brought an offering. Uh, that's the New King James Version. It calls it an offering. Uh, there are other versions of the Bible that might call it a gift or they might call it a sacrifice. Um, but at any point, he was bringing it to give it to the Lord. And we don't know exactly where he brought it as, as well. Um, oftentimes in the Old Testament, we see God um, commanding that an altar be built, or we see that the prophets want to honor God, and so they build an altar, and it's there upon that altar that they bring their sacrifice. It's, that altar is going to remain on for some time. People will see that altar, and they will say, oh, this reminds us that we need to um, honor the Lord, that we need to worship Him. And, and so we don't see that there was an altar built, so we don't know exactly where it was when it says that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. We don't know if he brought it to the entranceway of the garden um, from whence his parents had been um, pushed out or cast out, um, or if he just brought it to a, a special place where God often met with and talked to. Um, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, and if they had any sisters, um, they would have probably been present there as well. And so, um, both of these, uh, both of these guys, Cain and Abel, um, were good at what they did, um, and both of them um, brought an offering. The Hebrew word for offering is minka, minka, and Literally, that means uh, a gift of honor. It's a present. It's not a gift that's given to appease um, God. Um, as we see later on in the Levitical law, um, they are meant to bring an offering before the Lord, before the Lord um, which would appease Him, uh, which would um, uh, worship Him in the sense that He would... Um, not destroy them 
or cause them to suffer the complete consequence of their sin at, at that very time. The offering was brought to acknowledge and to exalt uh, the position of the receiver, in this case was God, as being more important than the giver. And in this case, it was Cain and his brother Abel. And so it was an, an honor gift. It was a present um, to him. And as I've already said, it's, it, it's unclear as to whether or not Adam and Eve had been taught um, to give an offering. It's unclear if God had taught them so that then they could teach their sons as to what an offering was supposed to be and how they were supposed to honor God. Um, but what is clear is the understanding that they dishonored God um, when they chose to disobey his word. And so when their eyes were opened and they knew good and evil, they knew that disobedience was evil. And disobedience was dishonoring to God, the creator, the father of all things. And as they dishonored him, they recognized that on one hand, if there is dishonor, on the other hand, there is to honor. And to honor is to obey. To honor is to give. To honor is to recognize God's sovereignty God's authority. Um, to honor God is to recognize that He is God and we are His creation. Even though we may be able to talk to Him, we are not equal to Him. And so therefore, being below Him, it is our, um, it is our responsibility to honor Him and being the one who is above us. Adam and Eve probably had come to understand that. They were created in the image of God, and they already knew what was good. They were given the, um, the ability to reason. They were given the ability to discern. They were given the ability to, um, to see things and to understand what the truth was. And so knowing that, it's very likely they would have as well taught their children what it meant to honor God and um, in honoring him, it's very likely that they uh, decided that they would give something of what they had done with their hands to him, knowing that he had given to them all that they needed to be sustained over the course of their life. So Cain brought an offering of grain, while Abel brought the meat, and the fat of the lamb. And it's important to, to recognize that later on, both of these offerings, the grain offering as well as the blood offering or the meat offering, um, were important to God. And later on in the Levitical law, um, the children of Israel were brought, were, they were taught to bring both of these types of offerings before the Lord. The point of the offering, however, is not what is given, but it is the heart of the giver. The important thing to note is that God, um, he looks at the offering, but he's looking at the heart and the mind of the person who is giving the offering more than anything else. Look here, if you will, at verse 4, it says, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. You see there that first, God looked at the heart of Abel and he respected Abel for what he was. He was bringing his offering out of sincere um, recognition that God was sovereign over his life. He was bringing his offering by faith, believing that he would be able to please God with what he had done with his hands. Um, and God saw that, 
and God respected Abel, and therefore he respected Abel's offering. But look at verse 5. But he, that is God, did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And so in this particular sense, God looked at their hearts, and he recognized that Cain's heart was right, and his motivation um, was correct. He was wanting to honor God. However, Cain, his heart was not right before God. His motivation was not that to honor God. His motivation was to do it because he was having to do it. This is what was dictated to him in order to to do. And so it was basically um, the attitude that we see in uh, children as they're being raised, you know, I'm going to do it, but I don't like the fact that I'm having to do it. And that's pretty much where Cain was on that particular day. Um, And that's probably indicative of the way that his heart was before the Lord on a daily basis. He did his work, but he didn't like the fact that he did it. He had to do his work. He didn't like the fact that he had to farm. He didn't like the fact that he had to work by the sweat of his brow. He didn't like the fact that he would have to toil after the things that they would eat. And so he was already upset with the situation, and that comes out. And God is able to see that when he brings the offering to him. The Bible reminds us that although men often look at the outer appearance, God always looks at the heart. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. God was uh, looking at the heart of Abel, and he saw um, a person who was righteous before him because his motivation was to please God and honor God. Cain, he was just the opposite. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 says this, For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so um, God was looking at the heart, and God saw that Cain's heart was not right. We see that reflected in verse 6 and 7 as well. It says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Then he responds, he says to him, If you do well, will you not be accepted? So basically, by his saying, If you do well, he, um, he is literally saying, You know, if you strive to please me, and that's what your motivation is, then things would work out. Um, And so we see that Cain's motivation was not to please God. Um, Cain received this warning from the Lord concerning his heart. And we could kind of look at this and we could infer some different things here. If you do not do well, or in other words, if you're not motivated to please me, then sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. Uh, Sin wants to lead you further into unrighteousness, away from what uh, me or what pleases me, and away from a relationship with me. Uh, But you should rule over it. So in other words, rather than allowing it to rule over you, you should rule over it. And so Cain had given in to this uh, temptation within his heart. It produced sin within his life. And because of that, he grew angrier and angrier. Now look with me, if you will, verses 8 through 12. This is the section that the writer calls sentenced. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and killed him. Then he, then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? 
And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Cain had refused to heed the warning of God. He, he and his brother went out to the field, and we don't know the conversation that took place. What we do know, that Cain allowed his unjustified anger to gain the full qualities of evil within his heart. Selfishness, hatred, deception, disregard for God, commitment to chaos, destruction, and death, and as well, a complete absence of right and what would be right between two people and what is right between a person and God. And Cain killed his brother Abel. Murder. Murder is a reflection of Cain's sinful, evil heart. And today, sadly, it has become um, an everyday part of human existence. Murder exists. Lucifer, Satan, thinks that he has won, but um, on the contrary, he has not won the battle. Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus won the battle at the cross. And uh, we will take a look at a couple of verses here in just a few moments. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, tells us this that we were dead in trespasses and sins, in which we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, feeling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God has saved us through Jesus Christ, his son. There is no salvation for Cain and what he had done. He was cast out from that place. The Bible tells us that he was pushed eastward to a land that was called Nod, a land that was barren where he would need to roam over the course of his life, not really having any permanent home, not having a way really to um, uh, make a living, he would have to find something new. And so Cain was sentenced to be a fugitive and a vagabond. He was driven out from his family and the life that he knew to an even harder life. All of us have been like Cain. We have all um, submitted ourselves to sin and the consequence of sin both the consequence, which is death, but as well the consequence, which is sinful action and lifestyle here upon the face of the earth. But God, in the richness of his mercy and grace, has made it possible for us to escape not only the consequence of sin, but to escape the power of sin in our life. God did it through Jesus Christ his only begotten Son, knowing that He loved us and did not want us to perish, but have an everlasting life and a relationship, ongoing relationship with Him for all of eternity. For Cain, well, the consequence of his action, he felt like was too much, too much for him to handle. It says in verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And so he's basically saying that whoever sees me out there, I'm going to end up in the same way uh, that my brother has ended up. 
And then it, it says, The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. And so Cain pled his case before God that his sentence was too harsh. God um, mercifully and graciously uh, allowed Cain to live and pushed him away from this area and as well put some type of a mark upon him so that others, as they saw him, would recognize him um, as being the person that they were not supposed to kill. And so we close this out. There's some question marks here that we don't necessarily have uh, the answers for. Um, one of those question marks is, is that you know, when Cain says um, here, um, when Cain says here in verse 14, um, I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Anyone. And so the question mark is, well, were there other people on the face of the earth? And the answer to that is, is that well, we don't know how many other people were on the face of the earth. We have the story of Cain and Abel, and we believe that Cain was um, Eve's firstborn son. And we would anticipate, because the Bible clearly tells us back in chapter 3 and verse 20, that Eve was the mother of all, meaning all people, um, all human life upon the face of the earth that there would have been others that she bore, um, girls as well as boys, over the course of time. We don't know how old Adam and Eve were at this particular point. They could have lived for um, not only decades, but um, they could have already been alive for well over a uh, hundred years before, um, before Cain um, was born, and they could have been alive for well over a hundred years before Cain killed his brother Adam. And so Cain would have recognized, hey, we live a long time, and you know, there are other people that are being born, and so somebody out there is going to hear the story, they're going to come across me, and then they as well will kill me because of what I did to my brother. So we don't have all of those answers. Um, there's a lot left unanswered in this particular story. Just as um, down in verse 16 and 17, where it says that Cain went out from their presence, uh, the presence of the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Well, where did his wife come from? Uh, she probably was one of his sisters that was born at some particular time because Eve was the mother of all human life at that particular point. Here's what we know from this. Sin has a consequence, and the consequence of sin is death. God said, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Eventually, Adam and Eve both died. Cain killed his brother Abel, and Abel died at a young age. Evil was in Cain's heart. Later, he would die, and his offspring ultimately would die. Death is the result of sin, and it's most certainly the result of evil. Romans tells us that... Um, <clears throat> There is an escape uh, for that consequence. There is now no longer condemnation for the results of sin in the hearts and the lives of one who is in Christ Jesus. Let me give you these couple of verses for you to look up and then I'll be done. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 6. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, 
And then Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13. And verse 13 says, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Cain didn't have that opportunity. The first murder resulted in the death of Abel and ultimately later on in the death of Cain. You know, it's important to study God's Word. That's where we gain great wisdom and understanding of who God is, how He works, and what He desires of our life during the time that we have here upon this planet. I hope that you have gotten something out of this lesson. I know it's a little bit long, um, but as well, uh, if you can, uh, like it and share it with others so that they can be blessed by it as well. Um, Temple Baptist Church, if you don't have a church home, meets on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., and then there's a Sunday school hour at 9 a.m. that's tucked in between the two morning worship times. We'd love for you to come and join us and uh, let us help you grow in your faith. God bless you. Happy New Year. I hope that you have a great rest of the day, and um, we look forward to seeing you uh, at some point in 2024. So long.